Um, thanks very much, Michel. Um, thank you, Michael, and to everyone involved in the um, EVICT project, a project that is doing so much, really, and is producing so much research for, for the rest of us, that is, uh, that is, is making a real difference. It's for me a, a pleasure and an honor to spend uh, the next 60 minutes or so talking, speaking with you about, um, about this project, um, the right to property, taking economic, social, and cultural rights seriously. Um, the paper or the, the paper I'm going to present uh, has been accepted for publication by Human Rights Quarterly, and uh, we sh I should expect to see it in the second issue of uh, next next year. And I want to use also this project uh, as the baseline for uh, a longer project later on, and I will present that uh, later towards the end of my uh, presentation. I have a, a brief PowerPoint I'd like to use, if I, if I may. Um, so hopefully you can see in full screen, in full screen uh, now. I will uh, see what? only the, um, like, but the slides on the left side. Do we see not the presenter mode? Not the presenter mode. I have, I have, uh, oh, why, why is this? Uh, um, hmm. Let me see if I stop sharing and I share again. What about now? Yeah, now we see the okay. presenter mode. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> so the right to property taking economic, social, and cultural rights seriously. I will say ESCR uh, from now on for short. Um, this is sort of the metaphor I would like to use for us to think about the the point I'm trying to convey. I I believe those of our working on ESCR issues, either in, at academia or as practitioners. We've been um, hitting a wall, uh, the wall of property. We work on housing, we work on health, we work on education, and we are constantly hitting the obvious fact that we are talking about resources, some of which are private resources. We are entering, we are addressing issues or in conflicts with property, including private property, but we do, we do not name the rights. We do not address the rights of property as as a human right, or even as an economic right, or any sort of human rights reason, really. We see it as a wall, and we try to push the, the ball, the ra you know, with our racket balls, we try to hit the, the ball as, as strongly as possible against the wall, um, but there's a wall there. And, um, and I, 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 we take it as, a, as an obstacle, really, for how much we can achieve, uh, rather than, uh, I believe that maybe, there's some noise in the background if, if uh, I don't know who it is, but if you don't mind meeting, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so instead of instead of hitting the, the wall, I suggest that we display the wall instead, that we talk about property within and from the perspective of, of human rights and ESCR, and we try to reinterpret the meaning and the contours of property, uh, taking all ESCR into account, including the recognition of property as as a human rights, as a civil or economic rights, or, or potentially both, we, we can talk about that. So this is the metaphor. I suggest that we move from from picture on the left to the picture on the right. Um, I think property is a right that we dare not name. And when I say we, I mean those of us interested on ESCR, practitioners or academics. Um, since this is a community of people interested, particularly on housing, I have chosen these two quotes. The first one is from general comments number seven on forced evictions, which is kind of the primary document by the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights when it comes to evictions. And in, that, in this paragraph 11, uh, the committee says that uh, evictions may be justifiable, for example, when there is damage to a rented property uh, and there is lack of payment of rent. So this sort of assumes that uh, a breach of contract uh, um, between tenant and landlord can create an expectation on the landlords to recuperate the property. So it's a sort of recognition that there is a legitimate interest on the landlords. It's a sort of recognition that there is some valuable entitlement for the landlords, uh, implicit, because it doesn't say the landlord has a right to property and we need to respect the right to property. It just says that um, uh, indirectly that uh, sometimes some evictions might be justifiable in the case, for example, of non-payment of rent. 
um, more recently in Lopez Alvan, Alvan v. Spain, case uh, from 2019, this was a case of uh, occupation. Um, uh, the committee says, recognizes that the state party, in this case Spain, has a legitimate interest in ensuring protection for all rights established in its legal system, including private property. But the committee makes clear that property is not in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Indeed, it is not. And it says, okay, it is not in the covenant, but it is something that is recognized in the legal system of Spain, as it is in many other countries. And Spain has a legitimate interest in ensuring protection for all rights. And a little bit later in that paragraph, um, is, it says that, um, the committee says that um, there has to be, uh, or a difference has to be drawn between uh, properties that are owned by individuals, small scale landlords, and uh, properties that belong to financial institutions. And it says this inevitably involves making a distinction between the two. But it doesn't say why. It doesn't say why the property claims of a financial institution deserves less protection than the property rights of a small scale landlord. And remember, property is not a right recognized in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So why does the committee interpret these rights implicitly as if it deserved more protection for one type of landlord than for the other, if, as it, the committee itself recognizes at the beginning of the paragraph, property is not a right recognized in the covenant. It seems that the committee wants to make a point, a point, by the way, that I may sympathize with, but it's, it tries to make a point that is not actually providing a justification for it. And the point is that we're going to protect the property claims of small scale landlords better than banks and international financial uh, and, and financial institutions like uh, like uh, like Blackstone. And, you know, fair enough. It sounds intuitively, it sounds fair. But where is the justification? Um, and this is just two examples, two paragraphs that I think are quite telling about uh, about this uh, potential conflict between property and uh, other uh, social rights or ESCR. Uh, but I think there are other examples, multiple examples in the paper. I, I, I give some um, of other opportunities that UN and regional bodies dealing with ESCR have missed to interpret the contours of the rights to property. Uh, I, I, I will remind you that the paragraph Article 5.2 of the International Covenant says that not rights, no rights recognized in national laws, international treaties, or customs shall be restricted or derogated on the pretext that such a right is not recognized in the international covenant. And yet here, the committee seems to interpret the right to property of some uh, um, people, if we, inter if we interpret that financial institutions are people, but some landlords as deserving lesser protection than a smaller scale landlord. And I'm not, again, I'm not criticizing the, the, the merits of the position. I'm, I'm criticizing the lack of justification for such a position. But in other uh, opportunity, other opportunities that were missed, for example, General Comment 17 on, um, on Article 15, intellectual issues related to intellectual property, uh, the committee says in paragraph two that intellectual property uh, can be revoked, is a mere legal claim that, quote, can be revoked, licensed, or assigned to someone else, end of quote, unlike human rights, which would be, quote, timeless expressions of fundamental entitlements of the human person. This is in paragraph two. So the committee is making a clear distinction between intellectual property claims and human rights. Again, implicitly saying property claims in relation to intellectual property are, do not deserve the consideration of human rights. Another opportunity missed, in my view, is General Comment 24 on state responsibilities in relation to business and human rights, where there is no reference to private property and it's probably uh, it would have been an obvious opportunity, really, since you're talking of businesses. Um, another expression, another three other interesting reports that were probably missed opportunities were the UN Special Rapporteur's report on housing, report on fi financialization, 2017, or the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, on privatization, 2018, or the Special Rapporteur on Water, also on privatization, 2020. None of these three speak of private property. Um, one exception, perhaps, is in the context of COVID-19, uh, Juan Pablo Pohlavsky, the former independent expert on extreme poverty, uh, sorry, on foreign debts and human rights, uh, he says uh, that property rights are not absolute and a duly justified 
they should be able to take the necessary economic and legal measures to more effectively face the current health crisis, COVID-19. Fair enough. But uh, again, he did not provide a justification for this position. Again, a position that I may sympathize with, but I would like to see some sort of legal grounding to support this, this view. Uh, also, the current special rapporteur on uh, adequate housing in relation to COVID-19, uh, he called for uh, a global ban on evictions. He called for protection for small-scale landlords, not for large-scale landlords. Also drawing this distinction of Lopez Alban between large and small-scale landlords. Um, but no, no reference was made to private property. The one exception, possibly, uh, in this context of, uh, uh, of lack of references to property, uh, but in, implicit recognition that property is a thing, but without really tackling it, uh, is the current the, the ongoing discussion on the on a general comment on access to land um, by the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. It has certain uh, interesting uh, points made about property in relation to compensation, uh, to um, uh, access to communal lands, to titling indigenous peoples' rights to, 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 to cultural lands and so on. Uh, it has uh, interesting contributions, but there are two points to make. To make this general comment is thinking of rural areas in particular more than urban areas, although there are some references to urban, but it's clear that the focus is rural communities um, and their access to land. And secondly, it's only talking about property, sorry, about access to land uh, uh, in relation to and, and the issues that have to do with property in connection with land, which is very, very important. I don't deny that. But there are other issues that affect social rights and property that are missing from the general comment because the general comment is not about them, such as um, a private provision of public services, intellectual property, foreclosures or, and rental evictions, and private dissection and exclusion uh, uh, of public spaces. These things are not covered in this draft general comment because the general comment has a different purpose. So I think there is a need for another sort of uh, um, you know, a, a bespoke analysis of the meaning of the right to property and its relationship with um, ESCL. If we look briefly at where we are in the international um, human rights law in relation to property, uh, the, for me, uh, the, the, the analysis is summarized in two key words, in indeterminacy and polysemy. Uh, a number of treaties in human rights sector, in the human rights field, both global and regional, uh, omit references to property, and when they do, uh, there are contradictions between the different treaties. So these, these uh, contradictions, polysemy, uh, abundant definitions of property, uh, or plurality of definitions of property, and in treaties that are essential in the, in the domain of international human rights law, uh, there is lack of reference or only uh, uh, minimal references to property. Property is recognized, as we know, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Article 17. Interestingly, it's also recognized in another important declaration that was adopted a few months before the Universal Declaration, and this is the American Declaration of Rights and Duties of Man. Um, and the language, as you can see, is slightly different, because in the case of the Americas, uh, the declaration recognizes property that meets as a human rights insofar as it meets the essential needs of decent living and helps to maintain the dignity of the individual and of the home. So it seems that the extent to which the American Declaration is protecting property is narrower than um, in, other, in, in, the, in the Universal Declaration, which doesn't make a, a, a distinction, and certainly in, in the European context, where uh, the scope is much wider than the essential needs of decent living. Um, ICCPR and ICSCR, the two key treaties in the global machinery of human rights, makes um, make no recognition of the right to property as a human right. Uh, historians of, uh, of uh, the development of international human rights law point out that the two key factors that explain the silence of these two treaties about property are the rejection or the objection by the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc on the one hand, and also the rejection, strategic rejection of the newly decolonized countries. And remember, these two treaties were being negotiated in the 50s and 60s, key, key time for the process of decolonization, and were adopted in 1966. So property is not recognized as a human rights in any of these two treaties. 
um, but it is recognized as a prohibited grounds of discrimination in Article 2.2 and 2.1 and 24 and 26 of ICCPR. They are all the other key treaties in the human rights machinery in relation to children and women and, and uh, migrant workers and uh, racial discrimination also talk about property only insofar as it prohibits as they prohibit discrimination. If we look at the regional systems, starting with the European ones, since uh, uh, since uh, Groningen is in, in in Europe, let's start there. Um, the European Human Rights System, the European Convention on Human Rights, recognizes property as a civil rights, and this is also um, a debatable matter. Why should property be considered civil rights and not economic rights? And we can get back to this. Uh, but it is civil rights insofar as um, the European Convention on Human Rights recognizes civil and political rights. So property would be civil because it is in a treaty devoted to civil and political rights. In Article 1, Protocol 1, of the European Convention on Human Rights. The right to property is also one of the most commonly alleged violations in the European human rights system. Uh, between 1959 and 2021, I have the data here, the European Court of Human Rights found a violation of right to property in 3,706 occasions, uh, property being the third right that has been uh, most commonly violated according to the European Court of Human Rights in Europe, only behind fair trial and uh, the right to liberty and security. Property will go, will go first, bronze for pro property. As we know, the, in the European human rights system, for the European courts, the idea of possessions, of beyond, that the self protection is wider than material things, and also legitimate expectations such as uh, social benefits can be protected by Article 1, Protocol 1, uh, but the court has also made clear that uh, Article 1, Protocol 1 does not create a right to a certain level of social benefits. It creates a certain expectation of benefits that already exist uh, and are in place. So, this is a, so property is not a, 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 a proxy for social security and housing. If we go to the Americas, uh, I mentioned the American Declaration of 1948 that talks of essential needs of decent living. However, when the diplomats uh, got more serious and they uh, negotiated a treaty that was supposed to be binding on the states, they forgot about the essential needs of decent living. And these words are not in the American Convention on Human Rights from 1969. They would mysteriously disappeared between 1948, the more programmatic declaration, and the actual legally binding treaty of 1969. In 1969, it's, it's not in the treaty. Um, the uh, Inter-American Court of Human Rights has made significant contribution when it comes to the recognition of property as something that is um, wider than mere private property, and it has recognized the communal and collective rights uh, of, uh, of or to property of indigenous peoples as an expression of their spiritual life and cultural identity. And there are a number of uh, key key cases from the Inter-American Courts. These are these are three three of them. In the case of Africa. Um, the Article 14 of the Van Dule Charter of Human and People's Rights recognizes property. Uh, interestingly, the African Charter does not recognize the right to housing, but the African Commission on, on Human and People's Rights has said that the right to housing can be considered to be implicit through a combined reading of different rights, including property. So the African Commission has interpreted that housing is a human right in the African system because the Charter recognizes health, recognizes environment, recognizes property, and a combined reading of these three means that housing is implicit, implicit in the Charter. It's an interesting reasoning. The African Commission has a different view to the European Court of Human Rights about whether property is a civil or an economic right. In fact, the authoritative guidelines of the African Commission on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights put property as the first right. The property will be the first ESCR, according to the African Commission on, on, on Human and People's Rights. And the African Commission has also developed interesting jurisprudence similar to the inter-American one in relation to uh, communal and collective forms of property beyond private property. So this is just a very brief summary of the <clears throat> intricacies and the differences in, in the way international human rights treaties and bodies interpret property in international law. I want to share with you a proposal. Uh, this is a proposal of how we can take the right to property seriously uh, taking or right, how, how we can interpret the right to property, taking economic, social, and cultural rights seriously. And it's a proposal with four, four steps. 
and this is what I elaborate in the in the paper. <coughs> the first, <coughs> sorry, the first uh, um, proposition of my proposal is let's admit that property is a human right, and this is um, this seems to be more difficult for many of us in the ESCR community, who, um, as I said, have been acting as if property was a wall against which we are playing racquetball. Uh, let's take property as one of the balls with which we play. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should, we researchers and campaigners and people in the ESCR community should be campaigning for the right to property. I'm not making that point. I'm saying that I think it would be helpful if we recognize that property, a certain type of property, a certain interpretation of property, um, I will get onto that, is also um, a human right, and in particular, an ESCR, an economic, an economic right. Um, not only because <clears throat> property is recognized in the form of non-discrimination, and this is important, there are many communities out there that over decades and centuries have been denied access to property. And <clears throat> women, um, indigenous peoples, um, uh, ethnic minorities, um, ev ev even men uh, in, in the country where I'm talking to you from, in the UK, uh, men who didn't own property, up until uh, late 19th century or mid 19th century, didn't have the right to vote. Uh, so property has been, uh, um, and in other countries as well, uh, property has been, has drawn a line uh, in in terms of uh, uh, between those who were enfranchised and disenfranchised in the political system. So I think claiming claiming the at the very least the element of non discrimination in relation to property would be a contribution. But recognizing that property is a human rights. Uh, I think it would be helpful, and in this regard, I think it would be helpful to update this um, report from 1993, nearly 30 years ago, produced by um, uh, Luis Valencia Rodriguez, an Ecuadorian, um, Ecuadorian um, uh, diplomat. And it's as far as I know, the last report produced by a UN Special Rapporteur on uh, the right to property. It's a report produced, as I said, in the early 1990s, where information available to him was limited. He relied on information provided by states and think tanks, and he complains in the report that information was not um, equally rich in in relation to uh, all 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 regions of the world. It's also a report from a time of significant change in global politics: the end of the Cold War, the beginning of a new era. Um, is also a time when the ESCR community was in its infancy. There were not special rapporteurships on uh, ESCR. The UN Committee on ESCR had just begun to work. There were no NGOs working on ESCR. Uh, it was a time when um, the ESCR community really didn't exist, or if it existed, it was, it was really like a baby. I think now we are in a much stronger position, we people working on ESCR, to engage with this conversation and document more thoroughly the extent to which property is recognized in international law, in national constitutions, and the extent to which property is consistent or not consistent or compatible with ESCR. So this is my first point. Let's recognize that property is a human right and let's update this, this document from 1993. Secondly, <clears throat> property is more than private property. And when we say property, we, we tend to think, maybe we, those of us in the West, uh, tend to make the automatic um, connection between property and private property. And private property is indeed a form of property, but it's not, it's not the only one. And in the spirit of decolonizing the way we teach and research human rights, I think it would be helpful to adopt a broader understanding of property, including the other forms of property, communal property, collective property, personal property. Uh, in, the same, in the same way that the UN General Assembly's resolution 45-1998, the one that gave way to these reports that, um, by Valencia Rodriguez, that uh, resolution from 1990 recognized that property can be communal, social, state-owned, um, or public, it can be personal, or it can be economically productive. Uh, so let's recognize that property is indeed um, uh, private property, but it also has some other forms of property. I, I think sometimes we, uh, as I said, we draw an automatic connection between property and private property. It may have a lot to do also with this um, uh, mainstream view uh, that uh, property is one of the key, key columns of uh, Western liberalism. 
And I think if we adopt a more global perspective, not so Western centric, then we may have a more diverse understanding of what property, property is, including property, but going beyond property. Thirdly, I think we can make a contribution, those of us interested in ESCR, to um, make the point that property has a social function. Right? Um, so by a social function, I mean, and there is abundant literature on this, but I mean that property has an individual function to play in the sense that it's an investment for a private individual, even private, private property, for a private individual. Um, <clears throat> but it also has a social function in the sense that uh, um, it's, it's, it's serving interest uh, because property is one of the, is, is, is uh, inevitable in society, it's, a, it's, a, it's an obvious presence in society, and it has to serve the interests of society at large. A number of constitutions around the world recognize that uh, property has a social, a social function. I, I do not know whether this is the case of the Netherlands, but it is the case in some European countries and Latin American countries. Um, I haven't been able to find references to social function in case law of the regional human rights bodies or the UN Committee on ESCR, with one exception, the Tiriboga v. Ecuador case of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. I can provide the name later in the chat. In, 20, in 2008, it, it's, uh, it uses expression social function. As far as I know, this is the only one case of the African Com Commission on Courts, the European Court, and the Inter-American Commission on Court is the only one case, as far as I know, that refers to the social function of property. But I think it's, uh, you know, I don't think the social function of property will be at odds with the idea of ESCR as recognized in international law. In, already in 1969, in the uh, Declaration of Social Progress and Development, um, the UN General Assembly used the expression of social function of, of property. And in general comments number 17, the one that I critiqued uh, earlier, um, the UN committee established that intellectual property has a social function uh, to play. Uh, likewise, the UN Special Rapporteur on Housing in her report, uh, Leila Nifaha, in her report on financialization, she also used the expression social function of property. So I think um, engaging with the idea of social function of property will, will have a contribution for our understanding of ESCR, at least in three ways. Firstly, I think it will provide a more holistic approach to human rights. One similar to the, the one adopted by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in LACA v. Argentina, a case I mentioned earlier from 2020, where the Inter-American Court of Human Rights highlighted the interdependencies between property, environmental rights, and ESCR, uh, recognized in, in Article 26 of the American Convention. I think this is an example of the way in which the court adopted a very broad and holistic view of the dependency between these three key categories of rights, property, environment, and ESCR. And I think social function speaks to this holistic understanding of, of property taking ESCR seriously. That's one contribution. The second contribution, I think, is that uh, taking um, engaging with the idea of social function of property or from it, it follows that privately owned goods and services ought to be part of the maximum of available resources necessary to fulfill ESCR. If one looks at case law from the European Court of Human Rights, which does not follow this view of the social function, uh, in my view, um, but if one looks at how the courts interpret property and in relation to taxation, it seems like taxation can be a legitimate form of interference with property. And the question is how far it is fair for society to tax private property. But it doesn't look at the social function that taxation serves. It doesn't look at the fact that taxes are a means by which the state fulfills ESCR. I think adopting a, social, a view of social function of property can help us interpret taxation, not only as a potentially legitimate form of restriction of private property, but also as a tool by which we are actually fulfilling, acquiring the, the tools and the mechanisms and the resources in order to fulfill ESCR that states are required to fulfill. The third contribution, besides the holistic approach and the um, um, maximum of available resources, including private resources, the third one is that I think a social function of property can contribute to a more um, 
uh, to, to take account of the intersectional forms of inequality that combine identity-based inequality, um, disability, ethnicity, sex, and so on, with material conditions of inequality in the form of um, income and wealth inequalities. There are a few cases in recent case law from the three regional systems that are speaking about the issue, that have speak, that spoke about the issue of intersectionality in relation to Roma people in Europe, for example, or property rights of indigenous peoples in Kenya, or, um, or working women in Brazil, poor working women in Brazil. Um, and I think, I think this intersectional understanding of inequalities is very much in line with the social function of property as a matter of human rights. So that's the third um, point of the proposal. And the fourth one, is um, to make the point that fulfilling ESCR is one of the most important objectives that may justify restricting the right to private property. By this I mean that um, if we take property seriously from an ESCR perspective, then we will engage with the issue of um, public interest and proportionality in the case of conflicts between property and other social economic rights. And as we know, uh, it is, you know, generally uh, accepted um, in the literature and the practice of courts that in case of conflict and proportionality assessment, one needs to look at whether the object, in case, to, in order to justify a limitation of rights, in this case, in this case, property, one needs to look at whether the objective of that limitation is sufficiently important, whether there is a rational connection between the measure to limit rights and the goal that is tried to. Of the objective that you try to uh, achieve, um, that you have ensured that no less intrusive means are possible, and that also the objective is so important that it outweighs the negative impact of the limitation. I think taking property, uh, uh, interpreting property, taking ESCR seriously, um, helps us make the point that actually fulfilling ESCR is one of the most important goals that a society may have. And therefore, the first um, requirement of the proportionality test is met when a state is justifying a restriction on private property in order to fulfill ESCR as it is meant as it is meant to do. Um, the African Commission on Human Rights, in addition to these four requirements of the important object, important objective, rational connection, and no less intrusive means, and uh, the objective outweighing the uh, severity of the limitation. Uh, adds two more requirements to proportionality. It says that the process by which a limitation is uh, implemented has to be procedurally fair. And secondly, the Commission says that the very essence of the rights has to be preserved. And I think this gives us an opportunity to connect this understanding of proportionality with the, you know, um, with the ample way of proportionality, the way the African Commission interprets proportionality, with the art, with Article 23 of the American Declaration on Human and People's Rights. Remember, the one that talked about um, property being a human right insofar as it meets the essential needs of decent living and helps to maintain the dignity of the individual and of the home. I think this could be the very essence of the right to property, the one that needs to be protected, and anything above this form of property, this minimum uh, essential needs of decent living and uh, the property necessary to maintain dignity will be up for discussion when there is conflict with other, with other ESCR. So let me finish going back to the case that I critiqued earlier, Lopez Alban v. Spain. This is the paragraph where the, the one that I quoted earlier. Um, as I said, it's not that I am against the view as such, it's not that I think the view is wrong, it's more that I, 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 I criticize the lack of justification for this view. However, I think the view it is perfectly compatible with the position I am defending here, because I think this view, uh, the, uh, the test of proportionality, um, uh, doesn't need to provide a moral justification for this position. While the income from private leasing, from private renting, may be essential or close to essential for many private individuals, small-scale landlords, it will not be so for most corporate landlords. So the threshold of Article 23 of the American Declaration will probably be there for small-scale landlords, but not for financial institutions. And I think this is a fair justification to draw a distinction in the way we 
protect the right to property of large large scale landlords and small scale landlords. And I would like to see this sort of reasoning in the committee's justification. Now, final reference to this, what's next? Um, I would like to, as I said, this paper is going to be published hopefully in a few months. And uh, I would like to um, take forward this project with a, or this paper with a longer term project uh, that in response to these questions, these are the questions that are really motivating me. And um, basically what I covered um, uh, in, in the paper is a little bit of question one and a little bit of question three about the way property is recognized and interpreted in international law and about the possible meaning of social function of property. But I will also like to look at how property is recognized and interpreted in constitutions around the world, similar to what Luis Valencia Rodriguez did for the United Nations in 1993. But thankfully today we have uh, you know, the internet <laughs> and we have access to all the, all the databases and more information out there. And I will also like to uh, explore some of the implications of this uh, exercise in relation to some ESDR, and in particular in relation to private housing sector, private education, and the private provision of essential services. Pr finally, the last thing I would like to do with this project, if I am lucky enough to deliver it, is to explore with uh, collaborators what opportunities of international advocacy and strategic litigation may exist to advance the idea that property has a social function as a matter of international human rights law. And I will end here. Uh, thank you very much for your um, attention. And I look forward to any comments or questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Kasla. Very interesting presentation. Uh, I already have a lot of questions, but I will first give the floor to uh, anyone else who has a question. Is there anyone with a question or a comment? Yes, Jane Ball, please go ahead. You're still muted. Yes, I know it's uh, that. Can you hear me now? Good, good. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed your talk, by the way. It's nice to be updated on this. Um, but I've got one foot in the private property of England and another foot in which I've sort of observed for some 60 years now. And the other foot in the social side, of course, which I've followed for, never mind, lots of time at the international level. Now, um, I, I appreciate, understand and like the distinction between property and social function. But um, any change in a national system, some of which are very ancient, um, can and is going to undermine somebody. So the, the problem is, how do you get to from A to B? So how would the speaker protect people like that? I'll give a quick example to illustrate. That is the English tenants. Having watched it, my view is that the European definitions of property, which is very fundamentally different from ours, has tended to undermine tenants. And this would have happened even without legislation because there are influences. Um, because when I first studied property, tenants were treated as having proprietary rights. And uh, there's been a radical attack on tenants' rights in this country, which is partly political, partly inter international influences. But the great thing about tenants having proprietary rights is you immediately get rights against third parties automatically. Um, so I'll stop there and, and see how you think people are going to, how you're going to protect national systems from the incursion of universal definitions. Um, okay, thanks very much for 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 the question. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm not sure. Um, um, I mean, I missed the detail about how it is that the European understanding of property has affected negatively tenants' rights in the UK. It has certainly not protected tenants in the private rental sector. We have you know FJM v UK, the McDonald case. So it didn't provide the protection, but. Uh, I may be wrong on this, but I, and and that's one point. And the second point is through McCann, social tenants were protected in a way that uh, um, UK authorities didn't want to protect. And in the end, they they changed the law um, uh, through the pressure or because of the pressure exercised from Strasbourg. But I do not know, and this is 
certainly because of my lack of knowledge of this, but I do not know why the European definition of property has negatively affected tenants, uh, whether this is something that is coming from Strasbourg or is coming from Westminster, uh, I, I do not know. Um, and something that I want to do with this project, but, but Jane, please uh, elaborate on, and, and tell me what I'm missing, but something I want to do with the project is to look at com uh, comparative constitutionalism, how different countries are recognizing property. I, I know because Podrick, who is in, here in the audience, have told me that there are certain countries that don't recognize property in the constitution, or that did recognize property in the constitution and then they changed their mind and no longer. And I want to see how, you know, what implication that has. Likewise, there are other countries such as Chile that recognizes property in the 1980 constitution so much uh, that it actually recognizes property at the expense of other rights. And some lawyers try to get creative interpreting social rights uh, as a matter of right to property. So right to property of my expectation of housing, or right to property of my expectation of education. This is the reason and it seems to work in some cases. So there, there seems to be a lot of differences in different regional systems and different countries. And that's precisely what I would like to do in the project, get a sense of you know, how this plays out at the national level in, in, in some of these cases. Yeah, well, I, I wrote a piece ages ago, which is called, okay, I think it was called, I could probably let you have a copy, Chaos or Necessity, How European Legal Systems Protect Tenants in Four Different Ways. Okay. And and it's the constant friction, you know, be, between these different ways of doing things. And it, it it's partly definitional. So, you know, 40 years ago, if you were looking to protect tenants, you'd look in the book Legal Property. And in fact, it was separate, was to do with the fact there was such a lot of it. <laughs> but um, the social designation of tenants' rights has tended to undermine tenants because it, it, it is narrower in English and also less legal. <laughs> um, maybe we ought to have an exchange about that. I mean, yes. it, the definitional problem also applies to inheritance because uh, German property law contains, you know, the right, the L, what is it, the Elre, Elbrecht, that's what it is. It includes inheritance mm -hmm. um, and, and the compulsory inheritance element is so strong that, that people would regard it as a breach of their rights if they didn't receive their parents' property. Whilst in England, we've always had a right to free inheritance. And that's been eroded, eroded as well, because the Inheritance Family and Dependence Act has actually leapt into action and then expanded to, to protect relatives. I mean, obviously, there's a balance, but often, you know, Germany starts from I've got a right to inherit except and the, the English goes I don't have a right to inheritance except and it's very difficult to change those definitions because someone will get hurt. <laughs> right. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take your offer and I will, I will be in touch and I will look for your paper as well. Thank you. Thank you. Stefano Portelli, I uh, saw that you had a question. We Hello. Can, oh, yeah, yeah. Now we can hear you. Maybe I have to be closer. I'm, I'm, I'm on a phone. So thank you very much for this inspiring presentation. I'm a researcher in anthropology and housing activist here in Rome. And my question is about um, to what extent uh, looking at textual declarations of national and international law um, make us skip or overlook some crucial aspects of what is actually happening. My, uh, the question comes from an example I have here in Rome, in which the Italian constitution limits the right to property to, uh, according to its social function. The, the same constitution recognizes international covenants, such as um, the covenant on, internet, on economic, social, and cultural rights. But in practice, there has been during the last year a series of individual petitions for interim measures to protect tenants from especially corporate landlords that were evicting vulnerable people and i was i, I was a counsel for some of them but they were for whether from rome milan a um, lot of places as a response to the covid crisis the um, some judges some courts suspended the evictions until in may 
2021-22, the presidency of the Council of Ministry wrote to the Court of Rome requesting, black and white, not to respect interim measures and evict tenants. So mm -hmm. this was especially the case of a 87-year-old woman who was evicted in favor of a corporate landlord. Mm -hmm. So this seemed to contradict the entire legislation, both local and international. But my, pro my, my question is, to what extent is uh, both your project and your, your research work cover covering the domestic application of human rights law? Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I do not belong to your field of research, so this might be a stupid or banal question, but I yeah. hope it's not. No, I don't, I don't think it is, and thanks for the question because it's important. The first thing I would like to say is that my project is, is not only about law, but it's anchored in law, international law, and I, I want to work with colleagues in other domains of law, um, such as comparative law and private law, but it's mostly law, and I am very well aware that the realities of people going through evictions and going through problems with relation to housing are much more complex than simply what law can provide. So whatever law or international law may be able to do will be necessarily limited. That's the first thing I want to say. I don't think that law is a panacea. That's uh, I want to be clear. And less so international law. Within within law, international law is certainly no panacea. Um, <clears throat> that's the first point. Second point, yes, Italy has a social function as 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 have you know Spain and Portugal as well and most if not all Latin American countries have also a social function. Even the 1980 uh, Chilean constitution uh, created and written by Augusto Pinochet has the word social function. And even the 1925 Chilean constitution has the word social function. So certainly it's the word social function is, is, uh, is the, the way, you know, Gramsci would say it's an empty signifier. One of those things that sound good, but it's not very clear what we mean by it. I think if, if Augusto Pinochet knew that social function was a concept coined by a Marxist theories from France called Leon de Guy, probably he wouldn't have agreed to include the idea of social function in, in his constitution. Um, so I, the, you know, the fact that the words social function are contained in, in constitutions doesn't mean that uh, they are taken seriously. Um, and, and, and the fact that uh, Italy has uh, signed and ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights doesn't mean that it makes a very real difference for people who are struggling with housing and other, other issues. Uh, I want to um, contribute to provide meaning and flesh to, you know, substance to, to the idea of social function as recognized in, in, in national constitutions. And I think it is compatible. The idea of social function is very much in line with ESCRs recognized in international law. And, with, and, and, and I want to look at how these plays out or can play out in different countries, in some countries, because I will have to make a selection. Um, but I do not fool myself thinking that this is going to, you know, that I'm going to discover something that, you know, that it's just a matter of discovering it. You know, I think there are powerful influences that uh explain or why you know people are struggling with accessing housing or why you know some powerful institutions are encouraging people being you know judges to evict uh tenants without giving consideration to human rights often it has to do with pure power politics and sometimes it's simply that they are not aware of uh, you know the international standards either or they don't seem to care um so i, I think this is a long response i'm not sure what exam and really tackling what you point out but i'm aware the law has limits i will look at the reality in certain countries i don't know if italy will be one of them and i hope to make a humble contribution to how we understand social function more thing can i recommend christoph schmidt's national reports in his european study of tendencies yes it's in my it's it's in my yeah. references I, I used it for a previous paper i wrote on on section 21 evictions in england and um, and where I used also social function, it was published in the European Human Rights Law Review last June. I think Pedrick also had a comment or a question. Pedrick, do you uh, want to respond to using your mic? Pedrick? Ah, yeah, there he is. We cannot hear you. Yet. 
In fact, I see two projects, don't I? One in blue and one in black. Oh. You know, oh, I don't know. Okay. Well, first, maybe I can ask a question and maybe if uh, Patrick, uh, his microphone works and, oh, he's on his phone so he can speak. Okay. Then maybe we can address um, his comments in the, in the chat. He mentioned that uh, it would seem that human rights thinking on property is quite dated. No mention of regulatory takings. Uh, public health restriction on property and land are over 100 years old in most countries. Uh, okay. Yeah. Good. Um, I, I mean, thank, thanks. Thanks for alerting me to this, and I will. I will try to look into that in, in the next stages of the project. I was wondering. Um, do you think that um, your way of thinking, I don't necessarily see your way of thinking, but thinking um, as a right to property, as an international human right, what, what do you think would be the complications um, or the consequences for the vertical and horizontal working, workings of human rights and the relationship mm. between landlords, possible evictees and the state, for example? Mm. Um, yeah, I, 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 I perceive that they can be... Um, um, resistance to this proposal from two opposite angles. One angle can be the one you identify. Uh, so the idea, the traditional idea of you know human rights as having this vertical relationship between us as individuals vis-a-vis -vis the states, and therefore the moment you start talking about social function of property, you are creating expectations and duties and some sort of obligations on private access, and that seems to create friction with the traditional view of human rights. Um, yeah, that, that that can be a that can be a thing that can be an obstacle. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't think this would be the first. You know, I I think if we were some time ago, I think in the nineteen nineties, this could be a fair point. But I think in these days, there are many areas of law and politics and you know social domain where where human rights have been horizontalized. You know, from uh, um, business and human rights community, um, you know, school bullying, for example, uh, um, violence against women, and also in relation to um, evictions in the private rental sector and mortgage sector. So I think human rights has evolved sufficiently to feel confidence that we can um, that we can live with a higher degree of horizontalization of human rights than maybe we feel we could in the 30s. That's another reason why I think is, uh, you know, Valencia Rodriguez reports, the UN report from 1993, would be good to update it these days because horizontalization of human rights in the 1990s was not really a thing, or it was a, it was a, you know, it was a, a fringe thing in some academic circles, but I, I don't think it's, it's like that anymore. But I, but I agree that there are some, I understand that there are some people that will resist this view. Uh, but likewise, I think there are people that will resist this view from the other end. And in fact, it has happened to me in the last few months discussing this project with colleagues working on ESCI and different NGOs and so on, who didn't see much value of this, not because intellectually they resist, they were not in favor of engaging with it, but because they thought it was politically dangerous to give too much recognition to property and it's like giving way to your dialectic opponents. And uh, to them, uh, I, would, I, I don't think I would say that it's not, I don't think it's the right approach really to keep denying that property is a right, because I think it's important to engage with people who disagree with you, who often have a lot of power. You know, the Blackstones of the world, not only them, but also the, you know, the lawyers, the judges, the legal operators who are accustomed to dealing with property and not so much to dealing with international covenants on economic, social, and cultural rights. And also, I think property, you know, rec recognizing property broadly has done a lot of good to people who were denied access to property in a non-discriminatory basis, like like women, like ethnic minorities, like migrants. And one of the reasons why I will be in favor of recognizing the property as a human right is because even from ESCR perspective, fulfilling ESCR requires, yes, requires strong state, but it doesn't mean that the state will provide housing to all of us. If we, with our private resources, can ensure housing for yourself and for your family, then the state should not provide a housing solution to you. We know that much. So implicitly, we are recognizing that private resources are necessary to satisfy ESCR. So for me, it's a logical consequence of taking ESCR seriously is to take private property, uh, or property seriously, including private property. 
Okay, thank you. Very clear. Uh, Michelle, you have your hand raised. Thanks so much. And thanks so much, Koldo, for this uh, very interesting presentation. It's good to talk about the right to property and because we always talk about the right to housing and it's good to just uh, maybe also discuss its, uh, its enemy, as has been seen uh, quite often. And it's not true, as you have shown. But I was wondering if you look at the committee or the Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights decisions, what would be different if we take your approach? Because the committee almost always, or in all its decisions where it adopts a few, just acknowledge that property rights are a legitimate interest, right? Uh, it doesn't acknowledge that it's a legitimate right because it's not in a covenant, but it's a legitimate interest. There are also even cases now, somewhat newer cases that deal with squatting and it just says states have a legitimate interest in regulating and banning squatting. It should not, should not be the case that squatters are evicted immediately, but it should do a proportionality analysis and state should, if needed, offer alternative accommodation. Mm -hmm. So what would change if we just say property is a right then? Because then the committee will still decide that it will be a legitimate interest, but a right. And then the, and then the committee will require from the state that there will be a proportionality analysis. They can take into account that right. And then it will, it, it will check whether the state uh, offered alternative accommodation or whether it, it should have offered alternative accommodation. And oh. then probably it's up to the state to to offer that or not and the, the property owner cannot really do anything about that so what would be the the result i see the intellectual um <coughs> questions and stuff like that but i'm just curious do you think something will change in that respect or not really um i i don't i don't think um i don't think it will change in the way the committee is in committee interprets article 11 on housing and that, in fact that's that's why i say that i think Lopez Alban's case, you know, I even I cri I critique the reasoning, the lack of reasoning, but I I agree with the substance. I agree with the position. Uh, so I don't see why the committee will have to change uh, its views on in relation to housing. I, I I do not know about all the possible rights, and uh, because housing is basically the one right that has come more often, significantly more most often to the committee's attention than the, you know. I, I leave I leave the question in relation to the rights to another occasion. But in relation to housing, I wouldn't say it would change, but I think it would change potentially for other human rights bodies, and it would change potentially for how seriously we and people who do not take ISESCA seriously in national at the national level, how they take the views from the UN committee. I think if the UN committee and all of us in the human rights community took property more seriously. I think those of us who disagree with us would have fewer arguments, or at least we will be engaging with them in their own terms. We wouldn't say property belongs to you, housing belongs to me, and let's see who wins. But rather, we will be co-opting their, their, supposedly their right, which is property, and we will tell them, actually, you know, the right that you think is yours, or so important to you, you know, should be interpreted in this way. And I think the if the committee did this, and if all of us in the human rights community did this, I think we would be making the lives of our dialectic opponents a little bit more difficult. So that's why not so much the merits of the case, I don't think, the, the substance decision, but rather the reasoning. I think it matters. It matters in order to be persuasive, I think. Thank you. Uh, good point, as Michelle says. Um, it is exactly five o'clock. Um, that means that the hour is over. Uh, Koldo, thank you so much for your very interesting presentation and thanks uh, for the rest for this very interesting discussion afterwards. I think this discussion is far from over. Uh, so I would invite everyone to come to the next sessions or monthly talks of the EFIC project because uh, we often discuss uh, this clash between the right to housing and the right to property and other clashes. The next seminar is on the 17th of November and it's on access to housing. That will be a hybrid seminar where the speakers will be present uh, together in one room and uh, you can all uh, join uh, through the virtual link. Uh, thanks again, Kolo, for uh, your very you. interesting contribution. Thanks, Patrick. And I hope to see you all on the 17th of November. Thank you. Bye.
Thanks, Goldo. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.